That's my opening question. What's energy? <coughs> well, you were all right. You ever tried to define it? Does your book define it? Let's see. Back in the glossary. That which can change the condition of matter. Oh, that helps. Commonly defined as the ability to do work. Actually only describable by examples. <laughs> That's funny. Well, anybody want to add to that? I guess my favorite of that is the ability to do work. If something has energy. But yeah, we, this is my point, though. So you don't have to feel bad about not answering this one. I have a hard time defining it. And to me, and to a lot of scientists, even though they might claim they, oh, I know exactly what it is. It's this, blah, 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 blah. Go ask your dad. I want to see what, know what he says. I'll ask him this afternoon. Uh, I'll let you do it first. My point is, I don't really care what it is in science. I, I'm less interested in what it actually is than how it transforms. Most scientists deal with that, uh, that this conservation of energy. Things have energy, sure. And work is a way to transfer that energy. OK, now maybe we can say it has energy. That means it has the ability to do work, either in motion or by being lifted up or fall off and hit something, exert a force on it and change its momentum. But it's all about how it transforms, thermodynamics. Uh, if you're going into the scientists, sciences, you probably have to take a whole thermodynamics class. And that's essentially just how it transforms and how it's conserved. They still don't actually go into detail about what it is. They might try, but it's more about this. <laughs> so that's what uh, we've been doing, is conservation energy. We've been focusing on two main ones, potential energy, and specifically right now, gravitational potential energy. Energy associated with position relative to something. I have never explicitly said that this block has gravitational potential energy of what relative to the table? Ah, uh, good. I'm just a little disappointed it took that many seconds. But yeah, it's zero. It, it has no height relative to it. So it, it has no potential to do any work on the table from this height. How about to the floor? Yeah, now it's your height. So with potential energy, it's all relative to a certain position. I raise it up, it gains potential energy relative to the table and the floor. But it still has more relative to the floor than it does the table. There is kinetic energy, and that's the energy associated with motion. So anything moving has kinetic energy. It also has what else? If it's moving, momentum. Good. We have inadvertently uh, um, described another form of energy. Does anybody remember? Is it kinetic, potential? You all go, oh, yeah, right, once I say it, but I was just curious. Let's say something has potential. Oh, let's do this. This will survive. OK, I raise it up. I did work on it. It has potential. I let go of it. <laughs> Turns into kinetic. But now it's not moving, no kinetic. It's, it has no potential because it has no height. Where did the energy go? Did it disappear? Heat. Heat. Anyway, heat's a form of energy. Yeah. And what did the work on it to turn that into, to transform it into heat? I, I looked through that, and I let go of it. It, it still had potential, turn, decreased potential, increased kinetic. <laughs> the table. Yeah, I exerted a force on it for a certain amount of time. What do we call force times time? Force times time. Yeah, yeah. So the table exerted a force on the block for a certain amount of time, which Apply an impulse to the block, 
and cause the block's momentum to change. It's, it's stopped. Yeah, this force of impact worked over a certain distance. You probably couldn't tell, but I'm sure this and this deformed a little bit. It had to have. And that was how it transformed from the well, it was potential. Gravity acted on it to convert it to kinetic. But then when it hit the table, this work converted it from kinetic into heat. You, can you see the processes? It's just how it transforms. But the total energy is always conserved. Good. A couple head nods. Thank you. <laughs> At least I know you're alive. <laughs> okay. Who likes to go to Lagoon? An amusement park up north? Who doesn't like amusement parks? Oh, nobody. Okay, my wife doesn't. But wow, she doesn't like the ride. But it's fun. Those that don't like it, it's for the same reason that people like amusement park rides. Why do you guys like going to amusement park rides? Or maybe, you know, what in? Mm -hmm. Why do you like it? Let's see what you say. Yeah. Thank you. That's what I hear the most. Looked around, going fast. Anybody else? Who likes going fast? Yeah, okay, there we go, half the class. <laughs> um, my point is, it is fun going fast, but you know, we wouldn't like it if we only went fast. You said a term in there that well, it wasn't just going fast. How many have ridden on an airplane? You're going even faster. Is that exciting? Well, maybe for some of you. <laughs> But you can be going hundreds of miles an hour, right? whoop de doo It's just like you're, everything's normal. Until what happens? Turbulence. And what's turbulence trying to do to the airplane? You're happy going in a straight line at a constant velocity, and something force is trying to push it around, causing your velocity to what? Change. It's so, uh, amusement park rides, they, it's not the velocity going fast that people like, even though that's what they say. Now, you've had a physics class. You can reason this through. It's accelerating is what people like, being whipped around. That's speeding you up, slowing you down. It's when you take off. It's when you go around a corner. Remember, changing directions changes your velocity. And you feel that. It's that feeling you like or dislike that makes you sick. Turbulence. That's because you're trying to change your state of motion. Accelerate. People often don't like that. I think it's kind of fun to a point, but, you know. <laughs> so, here's my little amusement park ride. A little loop-to-loop -loop roller coaster. I raised this up, did work, and now it's potential energy. Let's see, I put it right. How do I know? How high should I put it? How do I need to make this roller coaster so that it makes it across around this loop? How do I figure this out? Do I put dummies in the cart and trial and error? Maybe. I don't know. <laughs> I doubt it. Because I've got to build the thing. But you realize all the energy you get does work to get you up to a high point, and then you just kind of let gravity take over. So you start with so much gravitational potential energy, that's all the energy you get. They rarely give you another push throughout the roller coaster. Sometimes they do. When you come to a flat spot, they might push you a little to keep you going, but so this is all the energy you get. Is that going to be enough energy to clear the loop-de-loop? -loop? Well, let's see. If you're here, oops. If you're up here, oh yeah, that was enough. Where's the break point, though? We're gonna we don't need to go up to Kingdom Come here. Let's just try this spot. Ooh, that made it. I'm going to do that again. Listen to it at the top. Okay, it's, it's actually not in contact right there at the top. Let's try a little lower. Oh, that wouldn't be good. Now, lest you worry, most uh, roller coasters have safety systems, and they clamp you on, so at least if uh, power went out or something bad happened, you would at least be hanging. <laughs> you wouldn't, they wouldn't let you just fall. But I, I like this one. <laughs> That's kind of like 
the minimum in this case. And they do have to account for friction. Some of this energy goes to heat. Well, the reason I bring this up is to emphasize conservation of energy. Just like with co our collisions, and it works with that too, total energy is conserved. So what energy do we have up here? Potential energy at top plus kinetic energy at top. Well, it's not moving, so it's zero. But we're like, it helps me remember in case it was moving already. Well, that has to ideally stay constant, right? That's all the energy. So if we figure out what, what's the energy right here when, it's, when it comes down at the bottom, well, that's got to equal that. It's got to equal the potential energy at the bottom plus the kinetic energy at the bottom. Yes? What's the potential energy at the bottom? Yep, that goes to zero. So now it's all in kinetic form. Remember when I dropped something the other day? If you know how high up this was and his mass? Right there. We would know how fast it was going right here, wouldn't we? Who sees that? Raise your hand. Yeah, not quite, huh? How do we know how much potential energy was at the top? That's got to equal the kinetic energy at the bottom. Total, total. This is mgh at the top, and this is 1 half mv squared at the bottom. This is what I find interesting. It doesn't matter how fat you are <laughs> or how skinny you are. Because if you divide both sides by the mass, you don't even need to know the mass of the ball or the people in, in, on the ride. Could you solve for velocity now if you just knew how high up you started? Nope. All right, let's do it then. I'm on multi do you see how I got rid of mass? All right, let's multiply both sides by 2. That'll get rid of the 1 half over here because that'll cancel that one. But we'll have a 2 on this side. And what do we have over here? V squared bottom. We good so far? We want to get rid of that squared term, so we square root both sides. And that would be the velocity at the bottom. So now, could you figure it out if you needed to? You know, if I ask you on a test or you're just curious because you're next time you're at Lagoon. But that's, that's how we uh, use this conservation of energy to actually figure things out and build roller coasters. We know how fast we're going here now. Questions? Well, you can figure out through centripetal force, which we didn't cover, circular motion, how fast you need to be going here so that you don't fall down. You know when you're going in a circle, it feels like you're being flown out? It's that idea. So they, they equate two forces, the weight, and the centripetal force, which is trying to change its velocity, but direction this time. Again, we didn't cover that. You can use that to figure out how fast you need to be going here. That's the minimum. If you knew that minimum velocity, what else do you know in terms of energy? Velocity. Which energy has to do with velocity? Kinetic energy. So the potential energy at the top equals the kinetic energy at the bottom equals, let's see, we got potential at top of loop plus the kinetic top of loop. This is 1 half mv squared top of loop. And this is mgh top of loop. Because total energy is conserved, the total energy here is the same as it is here, is the same as it is here. And if we know how fast we're going there, we know this. Yes? We know how high the loop is. So we know this. We know how much total energy and in what forms we need to survive <laughs> right here. So look backwards. Start, they start with this. This is how much energy we need. 
So how high up do I need to start so that we clear it? Does that make sense? Now I know how high to build my roller coaster. Now in real life, what, what do you think they would do? Would they build it exactly at each top? Higher or lower? A little higher, yeah, yeah. Maybe a little built-in safety. But there's also something. Friction happens as you go along. You might start out with all of this, but it doesn't all s turn out ideally in just potential and kinetic. You also have work done by friction. And they account for that also. Which would, if you, if you throw that in the total, you got to start with a little more, a little higher to be safe. And that's what they do. That's chapter 7. The different forms and how they, they transform amongst the, themselves. Questions? So that's a total everywhere. Here, 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 here. <laughs> That'll tell you how high, high up you go, too. Back up, if you could. All right. <laughs> Remember our collisions? Let's say we had a cart coming in to this cart that wasn't moving. And they bounce off each other. And this one ended up going that way. And do you remember what this one did? Yeah, it stopped. Because they were the same mass. And we set up the total momentum before equals the total momentum after. Is this an elastic or inelastic collision? They're going to bounce. I told you that. Or you, you can do the same game. On our air track, you take, well, the initial potential energy plus the initial kinetic energy has to equal the final potential energy plus the final kinetic energy. Well, this one's easy because easier because we're not changing height. So we don't have to deal with those. But it's nice to think about that. So basically, it's the total kinetic energy. Kinetic energy of 1 initially plus the kinetic energy of 2 initially has to equal the kinetic energy of 1 finally plus the kinetic energy of 2 finally. Still with me? They're the same mass, I know, but I guess you assumed I was calling this one one and that one two. Initially, that one has no kinetic. And finally, this one had no kinetic. So all the kinetic energy of this cart, one half mv squared of number one is going to equal one half mv two squared. And we saw that it came in. With a certain velocity, since they're the same mass, it's going to go out with the same velocity. We saw that with conservation of momentum as well. So these are consistent laws. And I wanted to at least write one out so you could see how it plays. And I, I did a few things where I told you, well, it could have been like this. You know, Why doesn't this one bounce back? Well, it's because the masses are the same. But if you, if you uh, abide by conservation of momentum, and conservation of energy, then you only can get one case on these scenarios. They both have to be um, adhered to. It would be the same thing if it was inelastic. So they stick together and move off with some velocity. How would that velocity compare to this initial one we slower. It's going to come in. This still has all the kinetic energy initially. But now they're both moving. The mass is increased, so the velocity is going to go down. So yeah, it'll be a little, it will be moving slower. And we could figure it out. It's just now this one isn't zero, right? You do have some kinetic energy there. And since they're combined, you could think of it as one half of m1 plus m2, this new v squared. If they're the same mass, then that would just be 2m. 
and you could calculate something if you needed. It's just they, they both have kinetic energy now afterwards, even if it bounces back or they stick or not. There is one caveat to all this, but any questions first? Okay, the one caveat is, I told you total energy is always conserved. That's still true. I'm not going to confuse you now. Total energy. Kinetic energy is not. Because you've seen it transform. Just take this. Where'd the kinetic energy go? It's gone. Was it, was it conserved? No. It converted to heat. When you have an inelastic collision like this, they stick. Usually, there's sound or heat created or energy in deforming it, like crumpling a car or the pad giving. And some of that kinetic energy is transformed, converted into heat or sound. And it's no longer part of your system. It is no longer with the cart. It go goes to heat up the atmosphere. So kinetic energy is not conserved in an inelastic collision. Does that make sense? But total energy is. Just want to make sure you guys knew that. Just another example of how it converts. Okay. Machines. The end of chapter 7 is simple machines. Do you guys remember the uh, six kinds of simple machines? You might have learned them as a kid. Or well, hopefully you've read chapter seven all the way by now. But what, are, what are some simple machines you guys know of? A lever. I heard pulley. Inclined plane. A wedge. Wheel and axle. Screw. I think that's it. Did we get them all? I remember six. Yeah. Basically, a machine is a device for multiplying force or simply changing the direction of the force. I can't emphasize enough machines aren't miracle workers. You've heard of a mechanical advantage? These give you mechanical advantage because they can allow you to multiply the force, make it greater or lesser, or change its direction. Force, they don't magically create energy, though. They cannot multiply energy. Total energy is conserved, so just because you use a lever doesn't mean you can magically create more energy out of something. But you can make it easier for yourself. Usually when we say easier in normal terms, it's because we have to do something. And we're either able to or not. That's the force we exert. So machines can multiply force, not energy. Uh, the work that you input has to equal the work you get out. Energy is conserved. If you apply a force on something for a certain distance, it's got to be the same thing. In and out. But you can, let's say it's, re it's really easy to do here, and, and you get a big force out over there. That's your mechanical advantage. You probably all used a simple machine somehow to help you accomplish some task. You didn't have to work as hard. I know I'm saying work as hard, but that means you can do it. The force you exert is able to be multiplied to get a big force out on the other end, maybe. So what happens to the distances? Well, you're going to have to move at a bigger distance yourself, and you won't be able to move it very far. You'll be moving on one end a lot. It might not go very far. But now maybe you have a lot of force, so at least it moves. Because with the force you can exert, it might not move if you did it directly onto it. But do you see that the product, energy, is still conserved? Let's do some examples. 
This is our lead brick. It's 26 pounds. Similar to that one we hit on top of my hand. Put it in here. All right. Then we'll create a lever. Blink. All right, here's a pivot point. And basically, I'm going to exert a force over here. And I'm going to move it a certain distance. Remember, it's the distance I'm moving it in the same direction. Not this distance. This is perpendicular to the direction of my force. It's this distance. So can I lift it? <coughs> yes. <laughs> but it's hard. So I wouldn't say this lever is helping me gain much mechanical advantage, would you? No. But it's fun, because you can just change the pivot point over to here. Now, I can, I can use my finger. <laughs> Piece of cake. So I hope it's clear. I'm not exerting as much force. So I just, I'm, I'm here. But notice I, I have to move further, don't I? I move, what, six, seven, eight inches? But I can lift 26 pounds over here. Big F. But notice how much it moves. Not much. It only goes up an inch or so, right? Let's turn my pinky. Oh, yeah. So that's the idea behind simple machines. Does this help? Uh, whenever you need more torque, or you, your force isn't enough to do something, you know? One I hate the most are uh, the lug bolts on a car tire. You, know, you got a flat and you're out there and you, you got your lug wrench. And man, the person put them on with a pneumatic wrench so they're super tight. And you can't exert enough force to loosen them. <coughs> Turn the wrench. Well, you know what you can do? If you have it, a lever. Often they'll put a, it's called a cheater bar over the um, lug wrench to extend the lever out. And it's just like this. So instead of trying to do it up close, I can't do it. Now I can. So I can exert a little force. I'll have to turn it farther, but I can do that. Because now it's at least possible. And I can get a lot of force over on the boat and loosen it. I'll have to, I'm way out here, so I'm going to have to go around this far just for this to go. But now I can do it. Check out an inclined plane. That's like this. Let's do that one after. How many of you have been asked to help your friend move? Well, you've moved. Pianos? <laughs> Last time I moved, and my friends helped me move a piano through the snow. I'm still grateful. Uh, but then I remember the most are like washers and dryers and refrigerators, lifting them into the uh, moving truck. And we could go like this <laughs> and get it in. But they're usually too heavy for me. I can't exert enough force. The force needed to lift it. So what do we do? We get a ramp. And we go, do 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 and we push it up the ramp. Because I don't have to hold the whole refrigerator up. Who's helping me? The ramp, the support force. I just need a, a enough force to overcome friction and a, and a little component of gravity, the vertical part. So I can do that. It lessens the force I need. But you're way over here, and you got to push how far to get it up under the truck? That far, a bigger distance. If you went straight, it's a lot easier. I didn't have to go as far. Smaller distance, but I can't do it. So I multiply force using a lever. Not energy. I still exert the exact same energy it takes from here to here is the exact same amount of energy as from here to here. Look at this. I do work on it. Now what form does it have? Oh, say it. Humor me. <laughs> Potential energy. How much? Well, it's based on its height, right? All right. Do, 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 do. I do work. I got it up to the same height. So it has the exact same potential energy. It's conserved. But it doesn't matter how I got it there. This might help. This looks like a screw, right? Something that's twisted, a drill bit, an actual screw. Really, all a screw is 
is an inclined plane wound up on itself. So it just increases the distance it has to get it's moved so that the force is less. You can actually drill through a piece of metal now. You could never push through a piece of metal, but if you go a long enough distance, you don't need as much force, you can still exert the same amount of work and energy and get through it. I like this one. As a kid, I never realized that. A screw, it's just an incline wound up on itself. So that, that's what these do. This is a, a screw to go, I push on it, a little bit of force, and it twists. Enough to get it fast enough it can fly. It's kind of cute. This thing on the floor is a, is a screw jack. Not hydraulic jacks that we tend to use now with a liquid or fluid. It's a screw jack. Can you see it? Who thinks I can't lift them? Who wants to help me? I need a volunteer. Or you can do it to me. I, I, I won't make any cracks about your weight. <laughs> I can't do this myself, though. Thank you. Do you want to lift me, or I lift you? OK. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to put this through here, and I'm going to ask you. Well, it's a balance issue, so be careful. Just go ahead and have a seat. You can face down. I think, you know, and keep your balance. I don't think I could lift her myself. But if I do this, which way do I go? This way. Yeah, a little force, one finger. But notice I have to move a big distance, don't I? So I could just keep doing this and keep doing this, but I'll spare you. Thank you. I could eventually get her as high as I wanted if the jack can go that high. It'll take me a while, but I can do it. Little force over a big distance, same energy as if I could just lift her straight up a short distance. That's what this jack does. Let's do the play. This is, this is my favorite one. I need three volunteers for this one. One. Two. Three. All right. Pulleys, we usually think of just redirecting the force. Which, if you just have one pulley, it does. You can pull down here, and it pulls up here. But if you get a block and tackle, you put several together, you can actually multiply the force. So, Brooke, I'm going to have you hold this end over here. And you grab that handle. I'll have you grab this handle. And we'll have a little healthy tug of war competition. So the challenge here is you two have to keep this pulled apart. You can twist it so it's not so bad if you want. And your job is to pull. When you pull, it'll get closer together. They're going to try to keep it apart. Go for it. And you can go like this, Brooke, because you're running out of room. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she's still winning. <laughs> I think that proves the point. Thanks. If you'll set it back on there. Thank you for helping. This block and tackle goes around uh, seven times. Goes back and forth. It's seven to one ratio. That means for the same force they're trying to pull and hold it apart, she only has to exert one seventh of that force to get it to move. So she she was barely working, and they're all like, Ugh! I couldn't help. She would still win. She could still overcome our force. So this is really helpful when you're trying to pull. You know get your truck out of the ditch or something, or, or hoist something up you can't lift. You can go like this, and it'll slowly raise up. Did you also observe that she had to move the rope a lot further? She'll have to move it seven times as far as they move to keep energy conserved. So that's what a pulley does. Uh, what else? Wheel and axle helps eliminate friction between when you're rolling. You just get some bearings in there, and you can spin. You can redirect the force. Mainly, it's just to get rid of friction. That's one reason it helps. We don't have to dwell on it. Here's an old school mixer. You can use gears. This has lots of teeth. These have little teeth, so you can change how fast they spin that way. 
and you can get these to spin really fast by just going around. If I go around once, these are going around several times. So in a sense, I'm, I'm magnifying force. Usually, we want to move a big distance like these are moving so that we can have, use less force. This is one where I actually have to use more force over less distance, but I'm getting these to move a lot. So this mu multiplying force thing doesn't always have to be up. It can be down. Because maybe you want to maybe you want to increase the distance. So these work well. I can go fairly slow, and these can beat the heck out of the Cool Whip, right? <laughs> or the egg whites. A wedge. That's essentially an inclined plane, a two-sided inclined plane. You're just redirecting the force, so it can help split something apart. Door stops, or splitting your wood for fireplace, or whatever. That's simple machines. I think you get it. Any questions? So one more thing with them, efficiency. It's the last thing of chapter 7. How efficient is a machine? This kind of goes with the mechanical advantage thing. Well, that equals useful energy output. Basically, what are you, what are you getting out of it? How much, what are you getting out of it? Versus the total energy input. Now, I hope most of, some of you are at least asking, wait a minute, I thought you said energy is conserved. Yeah, total energy is. But machines, you still have to overcome friction. Like this is a good example. Here, I wasn't overcoming much friction or air resistance. But if I go like this, some of this energy is being converted into heat. And so I have to, I have to use a little more energy this way than I would if I had to go this way in real life because of friction. So total energy input, what I put in, it's just a ratio of what I get out. It's useful. So friction didn't help me. So we just see the useful part. Uh, oh, an example. Um, Let's say you put in, I don't know, let's make it easy, 500 joules of energy. It takes that to get up the ramp. But by the time I get to the top, I only have 250 joules of energy. You know, you just like to look at the potential energy, it's that high up. How much energy was converted to heat? 250, the difference. It, it went somewhere because it's conserved. What's the efficiency? One half, 50%. So we say that machine, I'm making this up, is 50% efficient. If it was 100% efficient, we'd get all of it out. It'd be great. But most machines, actually, I don't know any machine that's 100% efficient. They're usually 50% or less because of some of this energy getting converted to heat. But at least we can still use the machine to multiply the force or the distance so that we can use them to do useful work that we couldn't have done otherwise. But that's efficiency. That's all there is to it. It's just this ratio. So if you have a question, it, it's just you look at what are you getting out versus what you got in, and it's just that percentage difference. Well, it is to efficiency. So when you're surfing the web or read articles and you see that solar panels are, it's only 25% efficient. Your first thought is, oh, that's terrible. Ugh. That's kind of common for solar cells. And at least we can use them. But yeah, 75% of that energy we put in, we're not getting back out. So there's a lot of room for improvement there. Can you ever have um, more than 100% efficient machine? Of course not. So all these people that think they made perpetual motion machines, that they just keep going forever without putting more energy in? The laws of physics, they would be defying. It, just, it can't happen because total energy is conserved. Usually when they think they have, they're just overlooking one of the forms that it got transfer, transformed into. 
So, I intended to start chapter 10 today. It's okay, we'll be fine. But I want to ask some questions on this. So, clickers, before we leave. Oh, turn this on. I think I chose three of them to ask you. Friday, I'll, I'll be shooting some stuff. We're going to do projectile motion. Remind you, it's chapter 10, projectile motion, not the orbit stuff, just the projectile motion. And if we leak a little into next Monday, that's fine. All right. It helps if I actually open the question. Up, that's there, that's there. Lights coming out. Let it cycle back through. Because I took too long. VJ1, VJ1, power, power, lights on, doesn't like me. Blinking. Taking its own sweet time to connect up. One more. Before I try to reboot everything. That's a good sign. Huzzah! Has our magic powers? <laughs> okay. Whew. So dog and mouse run down the road with the same kinetic energy. The key here is they have the same kinetic energy. So how do their speeds compare then? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. It's the first one. Has everybody gotten a chance? Holler now. Okay. Most of you B, the mouse. Why do you say it's the mouse? You're right. Let's help us all understand. Why do you say the mouse? Smaller mass. Kinetic energy has to do with mass and velocity squared. So yeah, if, if they have the same energy, but one has bigger mass, then this one's going to be going more slowly than this one to keep that product of V squared and M the same. Just to help you get in your mind that speed, just because they have the same energy doesn't mean they're going the same speed. It depends on their mass. Does that help? Those that missed it? Okay. All right, here's a pulley system. It's 
Basically, I give you the force and the distance on one side, but only the distance on the other side. So what would that force be? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Bang. Most of you would see you're correct. There's two ways I would look at this. They're both referring to this idea. Same energy, so this product has to be the same. On one side, it's 80 newtons for tw uh, down over the force, and the other one, oh, I described it wrong in the first place. I apologize. So it gives you the two forces. So what's the ratio between the forces? You can plug them right in and plug in the distance and solve for it algebraically and get 25 centimeters. I prefer this way. The big force is 80. The small force is 20. What's the ratio? One to four. So the ratio between the distances has to be one to four. If on the, the uh, small force side we moved a meter, then this will be a fourth less that distance, a quarter of a meter, which is 25 centimeters. And one more. See if you got this efficiency. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Most of you are thirty percent. Very let me turn on the lights. So that is you got three hundred joules. That was the output. The gravitational potential energy of the car is increased by 30 joules. That means you, you raised it up 30 joules. It gained 30 joules of potential energy. So that, that's what was useful. You, that's all you got out of it. But it took 1,000 joules to do that. But look at it this way. Had you flipped your ratio, what would the answer have been? More than 100%. And we just said that's impossible. So that's another way to check yourself that you did it the right way. And an efficiency should always be less than 100, 100 or, 100 or less, ideally. All right, I'm done. As you read Chapter 10, uh, I have one tip. It's two-dimensional motion. Nothing is new. We're just going to have to do it twice. Two-dimensional motion is nothing more than two separate one-dimensional motion problems. So, no, hardly anybody had a, a problem uh, as a class as a whole with uh, pre-lecture questions this time, which is why I didn't go over them. But I want you to go back and look at those in addition to the two more you'll have before Friday. Look at them again. You can answer those, and most of you did, based on what we learned weeks ago. Look at them now in terms of two different directions, horizontal and vertical. Because we're going to start throwing things and worrying about both the horizontal and the vertical. And we'll discuss that more Friday. Different way to look at things. Now I'll be quiet. Thanks.